Man, if you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. As you're getting there, man, the baptism that took place this morning. Man, I want you to know that God is doing a work at Highview. This morning, with the baptisms that have taken place already at Fagenbush and here this morning, we have now jumped over that 100 mark to 102 baptisms at Highview. How awesome is that? Which is amazing because we have not had over 100 baptisms at this church since 2011. And that we have over doubled the baptisms from previous years. And it's amazing to see what God is doing. And I love coming in earlier this morning and being able to see the whole trough thing going on. You know what I'm saying? Hey, if Jesus was in a manger, you can be baptized in that. You know what I'm saying? Right? Isn't that good? And then I love to see that Blake is wearing a youth medium. That's awesome. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, <laughs> someone asked me, like, wait, man, why are all your teaching pastors so, like, jacked up? And I was like, I don't know, man. I need to get in shape. You know what I'm saying? Like, wow. That's awesome. Awesome. God is doing an amazing work here. And man, as we dig into God's word this morning, we have been walking through this idea of Advent, which means arrival, and focusing in on God's peace. We live in such a chaotic world with so much change and so much things that are violent and, and things that are just contrary to one another, and we are desiring of peace. And we've been digging into God's word, knowing, God, who are you? And how do you usher in peace to our lives? And this morning, we're going to be taking a look at a passage which really deals with anticipation. How well do you anticipate? And we're not talking about the kind of anticipation which is the kind of reactionary anticipation. We're talking about the long haul. We're talking about anticipating that which is down the road. How well do you or how well do you look? For who God is. Next week is Christmas. Can you imagine that? Next Monday is Christmas. And when I was a child, I mean, that was the greatest moment of my life. I loved Christmas. I loved presents. And I was the worst anticipator. Man, I was always on the hunt for packages. I was on the hunt for presents in my house. And my parents would bring presents into the house. They would wrap them because they, they knew better, you know what I'm saying? They would wrap them and they would hide them. And man, it was like a cat and mouse game. And I would search out this old Victorian house I grew up in where there are all kinds of nooks and crannies and all kinds of places to hide stuff. I would go on the hunt. And eventually, I'm telling you, I would find those presents. And then, this is how terrible I was as a child. Then I would take that present to my oldest sister and I would pay her money to take a razor blade and cut open that wrapping paper so my parents wouldn't know. How terrible of a child am I, right? But I couldn't wait. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't wait to see what was going to be in that package. And then we would wrap it up all nicely and everything. And here's the thing. That wouldn't ruin the surprise for me. Like my wife will tell you still to this day. Man, just tell me what I'm getting. You know what I'm saying? Because I just want to know so I can anticipate what's going to happen on on, on that Christmas morning so I can open those presents and rejoice in receiving that gift. Man, we're about to meet a guy this morning whom God told what was going to happen. And it was that anticipation that drove him to search out the Messiah. And Jesus shows up. Take a look with me. Luke chapter 2. And if you'd stand with me in the honor of God's word this morning. And we're actually going to begin in Luke chapter 2 in verse number 21. Not up on the screen for you. But then it begins in verse number 22 on the screen for you. Verse number 21. And at the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for his purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who is first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit 
that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we come to you. And Lord, we are so thankful that you would come for us, that you would rescue us. Lord, help us to see you this morning. Father, please remove all that keeps us from you. Please remove any distractions or weights, sin, that we may know you. I mean, truly know you. Lord, you've promised, and you've fulfilled your promise, and we can experience this newness of life. Father, please rescue us this morning. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Here, following the story of the shepherds, we have the naming of Jesus. Remember back When Joseph had that dream and he was given specifically, you shall name this child Jesus. And Jesus, the name means God saves. Think about this. Even in his name, the mission of God is revealed. That he has come to save his people from their sin. He is named Jesus. And he's circumcised on that eighth day, which was in accordance with the law of Moses, so that he would signify the covenant that God had already laid down, that he would have that sign of that covenant. And then in verse number 22, take a look in the, up on, as we progress in this, it says, and when, they, and when the time came for their, their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. There were certain Regulations. There were certain things you did according to the law of the Lord. And one of them had to do with Mary as his mother in a rite of purification after 30 days. And there were obviously sacrifices that needed to be made for a firstborn male son in the, in the line of redemption. And the question we have to ask quickly is why? Now I understand Mary, I understand some what she has to go through. But why Jesus? He's perfect. He's He's sinless according to God's word. Why is he and his parents going about doing the things of the law? Which clearly helps us to see that Jesus came to be obedient and fulfill the law in every aspect. Why? Because we can not. He is perfect in our place, fulfilling every right, every action, not to destroy the law of God, but to fulfill it so that he is that perfect lamb of God who's able to take away the sin of the world. I want you to know that as we progress through this passage, that the clarification of who Jesus is and what he has done for us and his identity only becomes clearer and clearer and clearer for us to see there is only one Savior. And his name is Jesus. So jump down with me in the passage in the scripture. And let's take a little journey here with Simeon, beginning in verse number 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Here we meet a guy named Simeon. We Actually, outside of this passage with Luke, we really know nothing else about him. We don't know his occupation. We don't know anything about his background. We don't know where he comes from. But Luke gives him some descriptions that he's righteous, that he is devout, that the Holy Spirit is upon him. It's clearly seen that this man loves and walks with God, that he's been empowered by God, that he has a desire for God, that he's living out of obedience to the Lord, that he is devout, that he is righteous, and he is given the Holy Spirit, and his eyes have been opened. And what is he doing? He's looking for what is called in the scriptures the consolation of Israel. He's looking for a helper. He's looking for a deliverer. He's looking for the anointed one, the Messiah, the consolation, the one who is going to do what no one else can do because even though he's righteous, even though he's devout, he knows he has fallen short. And he's now looking for the one who does not fall short. One who fulfills it all. One who brings a complete and full deliverance. And look at the promise that is given to him in verse number 26. And it had been revealed to him 
by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. What an amazing promise that God has spoken to him, revealed to him that he is not going to pass away from this earth until he sees the Lord's anointed. Can you imagine how this changed his life? I mean, he began to be on the look. He began to be on the hunt, began on the search. We know this because, take a look at verse number 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the, the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. And then he says, we're going to look at this poem in a moment. But can you imagine that moment? Walking in the temple every day, looking, is this, is this the child? Is, is this the Messiah? Think about this. He has strategically placed himself. He knows the prophecies. He knows from Micah. He knows from other places. He knows that there is going to be one who is born king of the Jews. He knows this. And so he is going into that section of the temple where the children are dedicated, where they are brought and offered up to the Lord. And he is making his way in there and looking. Is this the child? Is this the child? And there comes that moment. That the Holy Spirit leads him into the temple and he sees Mary and Joseph. Even though they're humble, their sacrifices that they are giving are one of humble origin. They are not rich, they're not powerful, and they're not influential. But that was not even on the mind of Simeon. He sees this child and he goes and he grabs that child which is usually not a really good idea. You know what I'm saying? Like a strange dude walking up, grabbing a baby. But here, the Bible doesn't give, you know, everything else. So we just say, it's all good, right? So he grabs this child, holds this child in his arms. And it's in his poem, it's in his reaction that the identity of Christ is revealed. Take a look at it, verse number 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon takes this child, blesses God, thanks the Lord. I mean, just in this great moment of gratitude. And he's able to say, first and foremost, Lord, your servant... You know that word. That word is for a word for a slave, doulos. You know that he's saying, I'm just a humble servant. But now I'm able to depart in peace because my eyes, what's the scripture say? My eyes have seen your salvation. Now there's a key word. Oh goodness. Underline it, circle it. You better go study this word because there are many words and forms of words in the original that have to do with salvation. This word specifically in its compound nature has two aspects to it. Number one, the first aspect to it, and the the word that he uses specifically says, very specifically, this child is perfectly fitted to do what he came to do. What What Simeon is saying is that this child, this Messiah, this anointed one, this Jesus is perfect. He is perfect in every way and aspect that he is coming to fulfill all that is necessary to bridge the gap, to pay our price, to bring salvation. That's incredible to know. That word is so specific. I don't ever want you to be confused. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is perfectly the person who embodies all that is fully God and fully man. He is the only one with the payment price, and he fulfills it perfectly. But the second aspect of this word is that It's an experiential word, meaning that when he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, it's not just talking about a perfect theology. He's talking about a relationship. He's talking about an experience of this Jesus, an experience of God personally and corporately, that we are brought into a relationship with him that is not some distant cold thing going on, but there is a relationship that's taking place that absolutely is transforming his life. That is such good news for us. It is such good news that not only does Jesus come pay our price, but he comes to be with us. He comes to love you. He comes to welcome you. He comes to 
Make your life new and fresh in and through the power of his presence. You are not alone. Hear that. That's the good news of the gospel. Too many times we are trying to do it on our own. We are trying to do it in our own strength and our own power. And we experience over and over, you can't do it. You don't have that kind of strength. You don't have that kind of power. You don't have that kind of holiness and righteousness. But there's one who does. And he has come to rescue us. And it's here that we see the needs that he comes to fulfill. The first need that he comes to fulfill happens in verse number 30, 31. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Meaning that it's for everybody. No one is kept out. Salvation is not for the elite. It's not for the special. It's not for those who are wealthy. It's not for those who are privileged. It's no. It is, all this has been done in public. Which is a signal that it's all for all people. That he's come to rescue everyone who wants to bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That it breaks down barriers. Number two, take a look. It says that... He has come to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Here is where Jesus really begins to break down that which separates us from him. Unless you are of Jewish origin, every one of us in this room is what is called a Gentile. We are outside of the people of God. And whether we know it or not, we are born into sin and we are living a life that is in darkness. This is why the scripture sometimes is humbling to come to. It's humbling because it points out our actual predicament in life. It points out that which is all wrong in our life. And there's many times we want to run from that. We do not want to be exposed. We do not want to know how dark our lives are. We actually don't want to face the issues that we are facing. And so we try to run from those things. And here comes God saying, I'm a light in your darkness. I'm going to penetrate that darkness. I'm going to overcome that destruction. I'm going to enter into your life whether you like it or not. And I'm going to lead you out. I'm going to free you. I'm going to rescue you. You are living in darkness. And here comes the light to rescue us, to pay our price of sin. Because we are gathered in doing things that we should not be doing. We are engaged in things that are absolutely destroying our lives. And here comes a savior who's willing to pay that price and to rescue us from that life of destruction. That's good news. And not only that life of destruction, but to rescue us from the false pride of sin. Take a look at verse number 32. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Israel, wanting to be the people of God. Looking for the glory that they know belongs to them. Unfortunately, they are breaking the very first commandment and they've allowed idolatry to enter in. And they're not actually worshiping God. They have sacrificed the glory that comes from God for the glory that comes from man. Where are they standing right now in this moment? Where is Simeon standing? What, is, where is, what place is he in? He's in the temple. Where did the nation of Israel receive their glory? From the temple, from the law of God. And they begin to serve and to worship things instead of the creator. They begin to find their identity in stuff and things and and activities instead of God himself. And here, very clearly in Simeon's poem, he's saying, that is about to be righted. They are now going to worship God because only God is worthy of worship. The true glory is going to be Jesus, not the things of man. I mean, that is one of the most beautiful reversals that we've seen is that worship is going to happen and it's going to be right. It's going to be pure. It's going to be true. That's what we were made to do. We were made to worship. And part of worship is surrender. And here the nation, the the proclaiming is the nation of Israel is going to bow before the true king of kings and lord of lords and they're going to worship Jesus. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Take a look at verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising 
of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Jesus has come in and he has come to pay our price. And he has made claims about himself that keep us from just saying he's a good guy. Jesus says, I am the life, the truth, the life, and the life, and the way and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He has made a claim of exclusive claim to salvation. And no longer can we just say that he is good. No one can come to Jesus and remain neutral. It's impossible. You have to actually make a decision about him. And what is Simeon saying? There are going to be some who rise. There are going to be some who say yes, who repent and believe and follow Jesus. And there are going to be some who fall who rebel against him because their hearts are about to be revealed. Here's the humbling aspect of Jesus. He reveals our hearts. That which is here, that which we want to protect, that which we do not want people to know, that which we try to hide, the things that we know are going on internally, the thoughts that you have, the things that you are wrestling with, that which would right now, which was, if it was exposed right now publicly, you would never return. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that kind of depth. And he's come to reveal it, to expose it. And there's only two types of reactions to that. There's either... A surrender. Yes, Jesus, yes, I am that dirty. I am that wretched. I am that cruel. And I need a savior. Or there is a straight up rebellion. I mean, Jesus, get out of my way. Who are you? Don't you dare expose my heart. Don't you dare make claim to my life. I don't want anything to do with you. Those are the two reactions. Whether you know it or not, you may be coming in church every Sunday, but your heart may be as hard as can be. And no one else knows it except for you. The Lord Jesus has entered in to save us, to not leave us where we are, to expose our hearts. And he does it because he loves you. Not to hurt you, but to love you. Because he's come to pay your price. That's what I want you to see. That's what I want you to get. That's why Simeon is celebrating and rejoicing in this child, even though he knows the reality. He knows there are going to be those who reject him, who oppose him, who want nothing to do with him. But he's come to save the world. He's come to save you. He's come to save me. He's come to pay our price because he doesn't want to leave us where we are. He's come to rescue his Children, do you know him? I mean, honestly, do you know him? Because I have my fear is that there are many in this room who have left a gift unopened. You wouldn't do that on, Sunday, on a Christmas morning. You wouldn't leave a gift, gift unopened, would you? Especially a big one that says Best Buy on it, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't leave that open, would you? Would you? Would you really leave a gift unopened? The Lord is giving you the gift of gifts. And he wants to radically change your life for the better, to usher in peace. That's why Simeon is able to say at the end of his life, Lord, now your servant can depart in peace. He's able to say with confidence, Man, I'm good. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready. My life has been lived. You fulfilled your promises. Lord, I've seen you. And now with peace in my heart, I'm ready to come home to you. Are you in that kind of place? Are you in the place in your life where you're ready to go home, even in this 
moment. Because we don't know what's going to happen today. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Are you ready to meet your creator? The Lord Jesus has come. And he's come to change our lives. Do you believe in him or are you rejecting him? Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Lord, so many times the word is just so humbling because you do expose our hearts. You do expose our thoughts and our emotions and our fears And Lord Jesus, please give us the strength right now to surrender to you, not to rebel against you, but to surrender to you. You've shown us very clearly, Lord, in your word, you are Jesus. You are the God who saves. And you have paid our price. You took a death upon you that you do not deserve. You died upon the cross for our sin. Yet you defeated the power of death and sin through the resurrection. And you have demonstrated that you have the power to give us this gift of eternal life. And Lord Jesus, may we follow you. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, Do you know Jesus? I mean, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered your life to him? Don't rebel against him. He loves you. He has paid your price. He wants all of you. Don't let the enemy tell you any differently. For those who have given their life to Christ, are you following him? Are you like a Simeon who is now looking for him, pursuing him, desiring him, and you know it when you see him? Man, may we live this life, this truly abundant life in Christ. Lord Jesus, give us the strength to respond to you this morning, to leave nothing, hold nothing back. Lord Jesus, may you have your, with, your way with us this morning. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Mm.